Alchemy was an ancient form of pseudoscience that tried to turn cheap base metals into gold. Why gold? Because gold has held its perceived value to humans for at least 5,000 years. A cow priced in gold costs more or less the same now as it did in the age of Tutankhamun. Gold happens to have physical properties that make it suitable as a form of money. It is one of two noble, non-radioactive, non-toxic mononucleic metals. Mononucleic means that there's only one natural, stable isotope of the element. The other is rhodium, discovered in 1803 by British physician William Wollaston. Gold has a very high stock-to-flow ratio due to its monetary properties and history. This means that gold's existing stockpile is enormous compared to the inflow of new gold onto the market. Since gold remains somewhat scarce, it can hold its value over long periods. Extracting gold from the Earth's crust is a very costly process. Thus, an increase in its price doesn't immediately lead to a rise in the production of new gold. Put another way, the price of gold remains relatively stable over time. Had the alchemists found an artificial way of creating gold, they would have killed its value. Its flow would have increased rapidly, making its existing stockpile less critical to its price. Successful alchemy would have defeated its own purpose. If there had been a cheap way to make new gold, the metal wouldn't have remained scarce for very long. Thus, its price would have decreased over time. But it would have made the individual alchemist very rich in the process. Central banking is successful alchemy in this sense. The money issuing institutions of the world have found a way to create new money with no cost. No mining is required. They are the alchemists of our era. The central bank's promise of stable prices is as absurd as the alchemist's promise of cheap gold. The whole point of a value measurement tool or a type of money is in its costliness. It has to somehow connect to reality because of the subjective nature of value. Money created without cost is like fool's gold. It enriches the issuer and his friends while everyone else pays for the whole ordeal. This is also known as the Cantillon effect. The further away you are from the money printer, the more you pay for the counterfeiting. Alchemy might seem absurd to a person with a basic understanding of chemistry, but it's even more ridiculous from a praxeological perspective. It defeats its own purpose. The alchemist should have been looking for the properties of gold, not gold itself. What if an alchemist had been able to replicate the monetary properties of gold instead? Our view of alchemy would have been very different what if you could recreate the properties of gold? What if you could improve them? Would you then have stumbled upon a new element? Would you have to redefine chemistry? Atoms make up gold and every other solid, fluid, and gas in the periodic table. Protons, electrons, and neutrons make up the atoms. If we zoom in even further, we enter the strange realm of quantum physics. Here, everything is probabilistic. Elementary or fundamental particles make up the protons and the neutrons. The electrons are fundamental particles themselves. These particles are made up of nothing but pure information, it seems. They have no substructure. The information about the particle is the particle in essence. If we zoom in deep enough, Everything is information. Elementary particles pop into our world every now and then and form elements. 
but the underlying space-time field that everything stems from is a different beast altogether. Here, there's nothing but information. At this level, things don't behave the same way as what we can observe at larger scales. In the quantum realm, particles behave probabilistically and have extraordinary properties. They can be entangled, influencing one another at vast distances. They can spin more than 360 degrees per rotation. All kinds of weird stuff. Science has no definite answer as to why these fundamental particles behave the way they do. They have many different theories and interpretations, but let us focus on the information itself for now. Regardless of how the universe really works, there's an informational layer at its core. Everything is made up of information. The smallest unit of space we know of is the Planck area. These areas are so small that they can only contain one unit of entropy, a single bit. The Planck length is expected to be the shortest measurable distance since any attempt to investigate the possible existence of shorter distances by performing higher energy collisions would inevitably result in black hole production. So for the sake of argument, let's just imagine that these Planck areas are the pixels of the universe. Pixels that consist of bits. A bit is the smallest unit of information. It expresses one out of two states, one or zero, on or off, true or false, yin or yang. The Planck area contains a qubit before its condition is measured. A qubit is both states at once, both a one and a zero, both true and false. That is, until an observer measures its current form. When this happens, the qubit collapses into one of these two states. Which state it will collapse into is impossible to know. But if you zoom out, there's a higher probability of it collapsing into one of the states rather than the other. In other words, the reality we live in is probabilistic at its core. No observer could ever calculate or measure the exact location of all particles in this universe. The map can never be the territory, but only a model of it. Uncertainty is always present. This is not a bad thing though. If there was no uncertainty, everything would be predetermined. Free will couldn't exist. Put another way, life would be a movie rather than a computer game if the universe was deterministic. You wouldn't be able to interact with anything. So at its core, everything is information, and so are you. Luckily for us humans, islands of certainty dot the vast ocean of uncertainty around us. Islands like the elements that make up physical matter. We interact with these physical objects by attaching a value to them. If we find an apple in nature, we may choose to eat it, thereby nourishing ourselves. We may also choose to ignore the apple for some reason, like if we're full and don't feel the need to eat at the moment. We may also choose to ignore it if we own an apple tree, in which case one extra apple would be of little use to us. This is known as the law of diminishing marginal utility. It states that the marginal utility derived from each extra unit of an economic good always declines. This is why scarcity is so essential to value judgments. We all attach different values to all the objects we encounter in life. These values always differ from person to person and occasion to occasion. There is no such thing as, quote, equal value. It is always dynamic. A chair, for instance, may be regarded as a helpful tool to one person, but be an obstacle to another. We figure out how others value all things by participating in trade. The market gives us information about other people's value judgment through prices. 
through prices, the market reveals what others value. Prices are a reflection of the wants and needs of other people. If you tamper with the properties of money, you reduce the functionality of all price signals. Central banks do this to government-issued currencies all the time. These have an ever-increasing supply. Thus, the value of each unit of a government-issued currency is constantly decreasing. The market discovers stability in an otherwise uncertain world, but its ability to do so depends on the predictability of the money issuance rate. Money is the tool that we use to find stability in the markets. It functions as a ruler that tells market participants how to best spend their time and resources. What means to seek out to reach their desired ends. Now try to imagine a way to measure subjective value judgments objectively. Presume that the sum of every personal value judgment could be expressed through an element on the periodic table. What properties would such an element need to have? To find out, we first need to understand what makes something money. Money has seven essential characteristics. Durability, portability, divisibility, uniformity, limited supply, and acceptability. So, first and foremost, such an element would have to be stable. An unstable isotope wouldn't suffice. Resistance to change is crucial for an element aspiring to function as a store of value. Moreover, our new element would have to be portable and divisible. Portability and divisibility are two sides of the same coin, pun intended. This implies that our imaginary addition to the periodic table would need to weigh as little as possible. It would also have to be uniform or fungible. Furthermore, it must have a limited supply. The total amount of the element would have to be finite. If we could find such an element, people would accept it as payment for goods and services. It would live up to all the criteria needed to become a type of money. The fact that the free market discovered gold as an excellent form of money is quite remarkable. People participating in the free market 5,000 years ago knew nothing about chemistry. Neither were they aware of praxeology or even the number zero, let alone quantum mechanics and theories about a possible multiverse. Yet, the market chose a truthful form of money. The free market somehow knew what money had to be and do. Gold has a downside though, its weight. Despite its excellent monetary properties, it is not that easy to transport. Gold is, at its core, nothing but a dumb, shiny rock, but dumb nonetheless too heavy to transport easily. So why not try to imagine a new element altogether? What exactly would we be looking for if we did? Something durable, portable, divisible, and fungible with a limited supply. What would such an element look like? What chemical properties would it have? Well, its optimal atomic weight would be zero. The lighter the atom, the easier it becomes to move around. Where would an element with no mass end up in the periodic table? Well, no weight means no protons or neutrons. This means that our imaginary chemical element would have the atomic number zero. This would place it in the upper left corner of the periodic table. A new starting point. A new origo. Point zero. The first evidence of the number zero is from the Sumerian culture in Mesopotamia, some 5,000 years ago, around the same time as gold was first used as money. The discovery of the number zero changed mathematics forever. 
It provided mathematicians with a tool to discover all sorts of other mathematics, including, but not limited to, the mathematics of infinity, which is the opposite of zero in a way. The discovery of element zero might be even more profound. In some versions of the periodic table, you find more information about the elements than just their molecular weight. Information about an element's electronegativity and ionization energy, for instance. Our weightless substance would have to be able to both attract and bind electrical power. If it couldn't, it would hardly be an element at all. Something without mass nor energy would have no connection to reality at all. Our substance would also have to be robust. In other words, it would have to take a considerable amount of energy to destroy it. This electrical connection would be the only thing making our elements, quote, real. It cannot consist of protons and neutrons, since these would give it mass. It will need to be weightless if it is to be sent over the internet. But an atom without mass wouldn't have a position in physical space either. So how could we detect an element that only exists because of a connection to energy? We would have to find a pure, abstract expression of a specific amount of energy expended. Enter the SHA-256 hashing algorithm and the difficulty adjustment algorithm. Maybe we can find a solution if we approach the problem of discovering this element by reverse engineering it. A proof of energy expended to prove the existence of a unit of the element could be enough. A hash of a Bitcoin block beginning with a predetermined number of zeros is proof of exactly that. The validity of a Bitcoin block is easy to verify since all you have to do is look at the number. Thus, finding a specific hash makes it easy to calculate the amount of energy expended searching for it. In other words, it would be tough to fake a hash of a Bitcoin block. It would be almost impossible, since it would be more costly to fake it than to actually make it. So, through proof of work, we may accomplish what we set out to do. We set out to reverse engineer chemistry, to become true alchemists. No small task. A person finding one of these hashes would be the legitimate first owner of that particular unit of element X. The ethics of natural law teaches us this, finders keepers. In fact, there would be no difference between knowing about it and owning it. The person finding it would be its owner, regardless of others' opinions about ownership it would be controlled by whomever finds it. The information about the element would be the element. We've already established that it couldn't exist in the physical realm. It would have to be pure information in the literal sense of the word. Bitcoin is that information. Satoshi Nakamoto stumbled upon a new element, element zero by releasing the Bitcoin code. Whoever is behind the pseudonym didn't invent Bitcoin. They discovered it. So there now exists an element made up of pure information, an asset that only exists in the informational realm, a resource that one can beam across the internet at the speed of light. Held in the brains of its owners and exchanged by communication alone. An element that changes our relationship with information. Having more information about a particular thing than others has always been valuable. Knowledge is, at its core, the resolution of uncertainty. Knowing an answer to a simple yes-no question can make all the difference. A single bit can represent the answer to a specific question like is the game rigged to player A's advantage? If you know the answer to this one-bit question, a big reward could await you after a well-placed bet. Information like this has indirect value, 
but value nonetheless. The more society aggregates around communication, the more valuable information becomes. Communication is peaceful interaction. Violence is what humans resort to when communication fails. This is why having correct information is so crucial. With the introduction of Bitcoin, information itself became valuable. Information now has a literal value. This is an abstract concept and it's challenging to discern its implications. Holding the private keys to a specific Bitcoin address is owning Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, there is no difference between knowing and owning. You have to convert information with an indirect value into something tangible before you can trade it for something else. The bet itself can buy you nothing, but the winnings can. In Bitcoin, the information representing the asset is the asset. There's no clear distinction between information about Bitcoin and Bitcoin itself. When information is ownership, money becomes a language in the true sense of the word. It will put all the free speech laws of the world to the test. You can now claim ownership by communicating a string of numbers or by memorizing 24 words. The lines between knowing and owning are now forever blurred. The pen is now mightier than the sword, not only in a metaphorical sense, but also in a literal one. The dynamics of violence are forever changed. An element without mass is an incredible discovery. When you think about it, it's the solution to many societal problems. Whatever's wrong with how humans interact with the environment is one of those problems. The deflationary nature of Bitcoin gives everyone an incentive to save rather than spend. It is the literal key to a future without overconsumption. An era in which physical stuff is as abundant as now, but not as desirable to humans.